M friends, last time I finished this giant Karl Mordor in 135th scale. The thing about large models is that they're imposing and eye-catching on their own, but the problem with this model is there are not many places where I can safely grab it, because it's just so fragile. And that alone, I think it's a good enough excuse to put it on the most basic kind of scenic base. And the fact that the base and some figures add a bit of context to the model is just a small plus on top of that. Now, even the most basic scenic base with this type of model is gonna be massive. I'd love to build a large diorama with the munition schlepper and everything, but I don't have the storage space for that kind of scene. And I'm not feeling like doing another subject in Panzer Grey either. To make the base a bit more interesting, I opted for an oval shape instead of the traditional rectangle. I mean, I've done a few of these last year, and as some of you correctly pointed out, they were ellipsoid shapes, not true ovals. Yeah, you were correct, but this should be a nice oval with all its bells and whistles, right? I think I said it once or twice already, but double-sided tape is a great tool that every diorama modeler should have at their disposal. It's cheap, reliable, and it creates an instant bond. This foam has a perforated texture that isn't very bond-friendly, so to say, and some heavyweight measures had to be taken to ensure the cardboard will stay in place. So, what's the point of this, you might ask? Well, those of you who have seen some of my previous dioramas know that the cardboard works as a cutting template for the hot wire. You see, the temperature is hot enough to cut through the styrofoam, but not enough to burn into the cardboard. Of course, hiccups can happen, sometimes more, sometimes less, sometimes the cutout is always absolutely perfect, and in this case, well, it's not great. In fact, it's not good at all. But you'll see how it doesn't affect the final result. What counts the most for me is the box art that's gonna live forever as a part of this diorama, especially the sneaky gentleman in the corner. This picture caught my attention because it's probably the only one showing the mortar sitting on some kind of artificial hill of sorts. So that's pretty much the only terrain feature I could add to this scene. And for this task, I had to use my large foam cutter from eBay, because it's almost three times as tall as the Proxon one. And because it's so clunky, I have to use it in the kitchen, but anyway. <laughs> okay, this is the most I could do in the styrofoam department. Let's now prepare the surface for texturing, and as usual, I'll start with acrylic diorama paste from AK. This one is my favorite because it can be used for heavy mud accumulations on armor models, and it works perfectly as a grip paste in dioramas. It comes in a giant bottle too, so there's plenty of stuff for many projects. It's very gritty, and that makes it perfect foundation for the next layer. Smart Mud from VMS is the most magical, most user-friendly terrain sculpting material I have ever had the pleasure to work with. Is there a shape you can imagine? Chances are, Smart Mud can recreate them. Although, in this case, I just had to spread it evenly over the surface because the ground under the mortar has to be completely flat. You can grab this magic pot of clay at mishtoy.com and you'll get a 15% discount if you're a registered user and use the promo code MUFFRIENDS2023. But it's a bit sticky until it starts solidifying, and to make the process easier, I sprinkle it with fine, real earth from my garden, trademark. However, in the most unforeseen plot twist in history, the thin, even layer of clay wasn't enough to make a realistic impression with the model. No worries though, I'll work my way around it. Adjusting my plan, I covered the remaining areas with it. This time I wasn't worried about the evenness of the ground. The only area that has to remain completely flat is directly under the hull, because the mortar is sitting right on its belly. Also, the thicker the layer, the easier and more pronounced the track impressions will be. More real earth to ensure the clay won't get stuck to the model, and we're ready to make the most out of this piece of real estate. The hull can be now pressed much deeper into the ground, and this is something I always make sure to get right, because nothing breaks the immersion for me than a tank, or in this case a 120-ton mortar, levitating above the ground. 
I'll integrate it even more into the base, but for now, let's add some more imprints. I kept the original rubber track from the kit for this very purpose. In fact, you can put this type of track into your spare box for diorama purposes, especially when you're left with something very generic such as Panzer IV or Sherman tracks. And while I had the model sitting in place, I pushed the clay very gently against the tracks. It's just one of many ways of blending it with the scenery. And now that I mentioned spare tracks, I have a set of these old, poorly assembled Panzer IV tracks from a Freewheel model. In fact, it was the first set I ever bought from this brand. And in this scene, well, let's pretend they're from the Munition Schlepper driving all over the place. And I also added some shoe prints where the crew would climb onto the vehicle, trying to maximize the visual storytelling on this limited surface. You might say all these imprints are over the top, considering it's supposed to be the summer of 1941, but I found this cool reference picture with the French AUF-1, and the ground here is completely dry but soft and loose. That's the look I'm trying to capture here. Okay, now I need to leave all of this to fully dry, and in the meantime, I can laminate the sides. I bought this giant 1 meter by half meter sheet of veneer. It's only 0.4 mm thick, and it's my favorite material for the job. Because the shape is oval, it's ideal to laminate it with a single length of this wood, and interestingly, I almost used the entire 1 meter length of the stuff. You only need to make a few passes with a knife and then it can be carefully broken off. This is where the double-sided tape becomes your best friend because it makes the laminating process extremely fast and easy. The more surface you cover with it, the stronger the bond will be. If the styrofoam base isn't cut precisely under the right angle, or I don't know, there's some other imperfection in its shape, such as in this case, it can cause a few problems. But so far, everything always turned out well, as long as I made sure the bottom edge of the veneer was kept flush with my workbench. I couldn't be bothered to measure the exact length, because I could easily overlap both ends and use that to measure the excess. Then I simply peeled it off, although simple is not the most accurate word here. I mean, at least it shows how strong the double-sided tape is. And then I snapped off the excess. Then I just retaped it back, and the result was pretty much perfect. Okay, the only downside was the visible joint, but I reinforced it with super glue, and later I filled and sanded it with acrylic wood body. Now we come into the problem with those poorly cut sides of the base, but the veneer is so strong and accurate that it pretty much fixed the whole issue. The resulting gap is the difference between the veneer standing at the right angle and the inaccurate styrofoam base, but all of this is easy to blend with more of the VMS Smart Mud. I left it for a few hours dry and then I could remove the excess wood. First a rough cut with an old pair of scissors, <laughs> OGs of this channel might probably recognize those as my favorite tool for removing kit parts from sprues, <laughs> and then precise carving with a sharp hobby blade. This is your opportunity to add lots of wavy lines and add as much visual interest to the edges of the base as possible, so I always take my time with this step. Once that's out of the way, I gently cover the wooden cross section with clay, completely blending it with the groundwork. The result is a seamless, professional looking base that will enhance the overall impression of any model. But now we're gonna focus on the more artistic side of the process. First of all, adding authentic and eye-catching ground texture. Once again, using real earth from my garden, trademark. But this time I'm using a very rough variant of this product because my goal is to add large clumps of earth. The firing range for Carl Mordor had to be excavated and leveled. Otherwise, the vehicle would break down after a couple of shots. That's most likely the reason why there is a small excavated hill in that historical photo I've shown you. Here's also my um, ninja trick for perfectly blending the ground with the model. You just have to pile up some fine dirt around the tracks and then use a soft brush to move it around until it perfectly hugs the model. Then you soak it up with alcohol or lacquer thinner and this will saturate the earth and break its surface tension. 
And then you very carefully remove the model, because obviously we don't want to glue it to the base, at least not yet. And because the earth is saturated with alcohol, we can flood the entire surface with a generous amount of diluted PDA glue. This always looks like a hot mess, but once it gets absorbed, the final result becomes more evident. The ground becomes rock hard after a few hours, and we can check if the model sits nicely where it should. If yes, then awesome, we can move on to the more exciting stuff. And that little something is static grass, although its presence will be quite limited in this scene. Actually, now that I think of it, I like grass when it comes in small, random tufts. It's tempting and easy to cover a large portion of the ground with brushed on PVA glue and then hit it all with a static grass applicator, but for me, it looks way more authentic and interesting when you build up the grass cover from these small patches. You can go back and forth with different lengths, connecting smaller tufts into larger areas, and so on, but it's always important to make it irregular and leave some of that nicely textured ground visible. I'd absolutely love to add more grass here, because it would nicely capture that dry Soviet flatland, but again, the firing range was landscaped, and my guess is that most of the grass didn't survive this treatment. So I added nothing around that hill on the front side, and focused most of the grass towards the back of the scene. A static grass applicator is an awesome tool, but from my experience, it can only get you so far. For more authentic and eye-catching results, I like to complement the short grass with longer, randomly shaped tufts, and I find these to be easier to apply with a pair of tweezers. Also, longer grass is harder to apply through the applicator's mesh, so this is actually the best solution for me. But we don't have to be limited just by dedicated grass products. A large, natural paintbrush is a sweet source of artificial grass. Yes, I have pre-painted mine, but the color is not important at all. The last visual detail I added was these shovels I found in my spares box. My storytelling options were quite limited here, but it's the small things that count, right? Anyway, that's the scene in its raw, unpainted state. My main focus so far was texture and volume, and I think it ticks all those boxes. So let's now start painting, and what's a better way to start than a generous coat of dark brown primer, right? This is why I'm never worried about the actual color of static grass, or the paintbrush bristles, because I just love painting all over it with an airbrush. And for a nice fluffy look, flooding it with a dark brown primer is essential, as it helps with those sweet artificial shadows. Then it's about airbrushing with various tones of green, and these colors seem to be my favorite for the job. I mean, it's not like I spent time and put effort into finding a specific set of dedicated paints for grass, it's just something that I already had and after a few experiments over the years, this combination works perfectly for my taste. What's really important is layering of the paint, starting from the darkest towards the lightest tones. Because of this painted approach, the grass can be painted in any way you want, from bright, almost cartoonish tones, to vibrant greens or dry yellowish browns. And because of the dark primer, it's gonna look fluffier than it actually is. Not to mention it's gonna have the same visual style as the model, which is extremely important. I used a bit of buff for the final highlights, and now I'm gonna use this paint alone to post shade the ground. I used to prime everything in the past, but over the past few months, I found that the dark brown tone of the earth mixed with PVA glue is a good dark base on its own. As such, I find it much quicker and easier to spray diluted buff color over the raw groundwork. If there is a hill or something similar, spraying it directly from above casts very nice shadows, emphasizing the natural texture. And what's also huge for me, this approach can be used to bring out track imprints, or ruts in a dirt road, or whatever you can think of. It's the same color I used for pre-dusting the model, so it visually ties it with the diorama. Okay, I'll admit that this type of finish is not gonna blow anyone's socks off into the stratosphere, but it's a foundation for enamel washes. 
And for that, I'll use primarily these two, which I also used on the model. The key is to apply them very diluted with enamel thinner, something, uh, something along these lines. The amount and consistency of the enamel washes completely depends on the type of terrain you're painting. If this was a damp autumn setting, I'd be more heavy handed with their application, although I'd still use the same light dusty color for the airbrushed base coat. Because this ground is supposed to be dry and loose, I used them to enrich the surface with more hues and to bring out the textures even further. Note that I kept the model on the base the entire time, because this way it's much easier to match the effects on the ground with the weathering on the lower hull, especially tracks and wheels. I mean, check out how much more visually interesting it already looks as I'm applying a dark brown wash around some of these stones and some of those tufts of grass. It's, it, I mean, it's pretty sweet, right? I'm telling you, it's so easy and definitely worth trying out. Well, the good news is that the ground looks very nice and has the same visual vibe as the model, but I think it would be a shame if I didn't make it really crispy. Acrylic paints are very good for this next job, and I think it's good to experiment here on your own, because then you can find and create your own unique color palette. I mean, here's my favorite selection if you're looking for a starting point. There's a something very satisfying about picking out those small stones and clumps of earth with a paintbrush. But I'm not gonna lie, it takes time. Here, check out the sped up version so you'll have a better idea about the process. You can really crank up the visual detail on the ground to 11 with this technique. But not only that, it's very powerful if you want to define specific terrain features. For example, I didn't have to use a single pebble in this scene, because the larger clumps of the earth actually kinda look like miniature stones. It was just up to me which ones to pick out with a more grey stone to make them look like actual miniature rocks. I focused most of these fake rocks towards the hill, where they would be most likely excavated from the ground. And also a small pro tip, if you don't want to feel overwhelmed with the process, just break the base into small imaginary sections and focus on them one at a time. The process becomes much more enjoyable when you can see instant results, even if they're just on a small section. And let's now get back to enamels one more time. This light one, that's the one I used for the dry dust stones on the model, and here I'll use it for dry brushing. You have to be very careful with it, because it can be quickly overdone, but when you've got it under control, it brings out pretty much everything. That's really cool, but what's even better, it gives those painted rocks a very realistic look. That's actually something I didn't really like about my older dioramas, where the rocks looked a bit cartoonish. And lastly, you can quickly correct some of those darker washes, for example in those deep track marks. It's a very effective technique, and it only takes a few minutes to get it done. And because that was pretty much the last step for the terrain, I quickly finished the base by painting the wooden veneer with Tamiya flat black. I tried cheap household paint on some of my previous scenes, but it rarely dries to a completely flat finish, even though it's marketed as flat paint. So I'd rather spend more on a high quality product such as Tamiya. Anyway, that's our base right there, my friends. It's simple, yet huge, and I think it'll serve its purpose. Which is displaying the model and giving it some context. But I want to show everyone how large the vehicle actually was, and for that I need a banana for scale, aka figures. I painted them using my traditional method, a generous coat of black primer over the entire figure especially all those faults and shadowed areas, followed by a gentle spray from above using deck tan. It's not as aggressive as pure white, so it leads to more natural results later down the road, but the gist of the technique remains the same on all my figures. But I always enjoy looking at pre-shaded figures because the technique brings out just everything, you know, and I mean absolutely every little detail the sculptor created. Now I'm just gonna give you a very basic rundown of my approach. If you want to learn more about this method, I have a very detailed video where I try to explain every aspect of painting figures. At least painting them my own way. 
The technique is always the same, I just use different colors depending on the uniforms. So, the foundation of everything is a multi-layered glaze over the pre-shaded surface. This allows me to slowly build up the paint opacity while preserving those smooth highlights and shadows created with an airbrush. In this case, I needed only three layers for the field grey pants. Although the airbrush does a good job with those details, I still like to outline them with diluted black brown. It's basically a pin wash and it's good to do this first, because any mistakes, and I always make a few of them, they can be easily fixed with highlights. Then I dilute the paint even further and carefully brush it into all those shadowed areas. This enhances the three-dimensional look of the figure and you can easily add multiple layers if you want to have those super deep shadows in some places. And finally, I make a single highlight color and apply it very sparingly on those light areas. This one was mixed with field grey and a lot of sunny skin tone. It's a simple, streamlined process with predictable results, and even a total beginner can do it. I use an even lighter color to pick out the details that I outlined. This, in combination with highlights, nicely cleans up the dark paint, and the result looks more balanced and, you know, tidier. The same methods were used on their shirts, although here I used light matte as a base coat and pure white for highlights. I mean, there's a lot more to talk about, but again, I explain everything in that tutorial that I mentioned, so if you're interested, just check it out. It's not a masterclass in figure painting or anything, but I'm usually very happy with the results, and I don't feel like they're dragging the overall quality of the diorama down. And I mean, that's the ultimate goal after all. Having every element of the diorama nicely balanced. So anyway, my friends, that about does it for tonight. This is one of the longest projects I've tackled on this channel, and definitely the biggest model I've ever built and actually finished. I'm very happy that I've reached the finish line because the Carlo Mortar has been one of my dream models since I was a kid, and now I have it in my collection. And on top of that, it has a simple yet large scenic base and three figures to show how large the vehicle actually was. But also I realized that some models, and this is definitely one of them, are mainly about their size, shape and the engineering behind the real vehicle, you know. The model itself is the main event, so to say. And everything else is just, you know, it just complements it. And I mean, that's all fine, but I've realized that I enjoy projects where I have much more artistic freedom. For example, a leftover turret from an old model lets you be as creative as you want. So, yeah, I'm happy with this model, although the conclusion is a bit anticlimactic. But now I can focus on smaller and way more creative projects. I actually think that's gonna be my main focus this year. So, let's consider this model as a... I don't know the old night shift from last year or something like that. Anyway, I'm probably rambling, so let me know your thoughts about the finished model. I was a bit concerned about the base because I didn't want to make anything bigger, although that would have allowed me to be more creative and tell a better story, but on the other hand I just don't have enough room for that in my display case. So yeah, now I'm gonna do something more creative. Until then, I want to say thank you for watching, and a special thanks goes to my wonderful patrons who make this show possible. If you like what I'm doing and actually want to get more of it, and in return support my work, you can go to my Patreon page and see what kind of reward would you like. I'm posting there almost every day with updates from my workbench, we can get in touch through DMs, comments and emails. I'm posting one week early ad free videos, I also have some small 3D models for detailing your projects, a bunch of references from the real world if you need inspiration for old buildings, landscapes and so on, and last but not least, these beautiful studio photos which you can download in full resolution. Alright, dear friends, I'm gonna clean my studio now and grab something really small. Something where the fun factor is high and the workload pretty manageable. 
I also received a beautiful Machine and Krieger kit from my friends on the Plastic Posse podcast, so I'll definitely build that as well. And you all stay safe, stay awesome, build those models, don't just collect them, and stay tuned. <laughs> Cheers!